Well, one thing I want you guys to understand is, let me set this back up. Uh, after World War II, because that's kind of what we're focusing on now, this week's basically what we've done from World War II to about 1973 or four. It's kind of our focus uh, for this portion, and then next week we'll do obviously the rest. Um, after World War II, uh, the United States was, if you guys remember from US history, hopefully you do. If not, I'll give you a super brief uh, reminder. The whole world basically just gutted each other. The only country that was sort of left intact by the end of the war was the United States. We fought Japan, we fought Germany and all that. We got bombed at Pearl Harbor. But for the most part here in the United States, nothing happened as far as like them destroying our factories or our bridges or our roads or anything like that. So we got to pretty much stay uh, untouched, except for the deaths in the military fighting, obviously. Uh, but the rest of the world was just absolutely devastated. Europe was in shambles. China, Japan were in shambles. Um, all the colonies uh, that were formerly hold, held by um, uh, the Europeans were uh, obviously trying to fight for or maintain freedom. So the world was kind of a mess, except for the U.S. and you could say Canada too, but they're, they're kind of a small uh, population. But uh, the United States was kind of by itself. So the U.S. is sitting here and the rest of the world's sort of suffering and uh, uh, worried about falling in under communist regimes uh, or just suffering instability. So the U.S. comes up with a plan uh, to help everybody out. Uh, there, there are some strings attached to it, uh, but the plan is essentially, we'll give you billions of dollars in loans and grants as long as you uh, keep a capitalist economic system. So you maintain free trade, uh, get rid of tariffs, allow us to trade with you, buy our stuff, uh, and we'll give you a bunch of grant money uh, and um, loans to rebuild your economy and your infrastructure. Anybody remember what that was called? It was the bonus question yesterday. Marshall Plan. Yeah, it was the Marshall Plan. Uh, so the U.S., it's in 1947, I think, uh, institutes the Marshall Plan. And this is actually a pretty damn good uh, idea. It was even extended. Well, actually, yeah, no, I will ask. Who do you think would be an odd person or country to offer help to after World War II that we actually did offer help to and accepted it. Germany. Yeah, West Germany specifically, because the Soviets kind of had the East. West Germany, but not just, not just West Germany. We actually fought Germany less directly and harshly than another nation uh, we had to deal with. Japan. Japan, yes. So in a weird sort of never happened before scenario, who said Germany, by the way? Yeah. Um, the U.S., after a war, doesn't go in to like punish the person that, that they were just enemies with. Normally, like you'd go in and say, ha, you're paying for reparations. You're going to pay for all the damages. We're going to come in and control your economy and your government and all that. Uh, and we did sort of help dictate their government and form a constitution. But for the most part, we went in and, and gave them help to rebuild. And um, they did. They did very well. And so did West Germany. And now those two countries are actually good allies of ours, not like permanently enemies anymore. Uh, so this definitely helped um, the world rebuild, world rebuild, except for the uh, communist countries that aligned themselves with the Soviet Union, but that's, that's a U.S. history, world history topic we're not going too much into. All right, so that helps. There's one other thing that's going to help, too, and that's the uh, United States really wants to promote free trade. So whether you accept the Marshall Plan or not, they also formed the General Agreement on uh, Tariffs and Trade in 1947. That later becomes now the World Trade Organization. You guys remember the, uh, uh, I know you weren't alive yet. I don't think you were alive yet. Um, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center, the planes going to the buildings. Uh, that's who they were targeting. Uh, Al-Qaeda was uh, targeting specific, or the Taliban was specifically uh, targeting uh, the World Trade Center because they didn't like the US's influence on world trade and markets. Uh, so, this treaty is, of course, going to uh, reduce uh, tariffs and promote free trade. And uh, get the door, Peter. Thank you, sir. Free trade. We've heard this before. Um, who originally said, hey, we should get rid of these mercantile tariffs and actually trade the things we need uh, for cheap? There was a dude that thought that would be a good idea back in the 1700s. We've talked about him a couple times. Maybe you've forgotten. Who did you say? There's a guy 
who proposed this idea of free trade, not having tariffs, allowing countries to trade for uh, the things they don't make very uh, efficiently and then uh, uh, um, make the things that they do efficiently trade those away uh, for stuff they need. Adam yeah, Adam Smith, nice. Um, they're gonna base a lot of this free trade policy on Adam Smith. And um, it's going to be extremely effective in helping the entire world recover, along with this Marshall Plan stuff. Because in doing so, you, it's kind of a you help us, we help you sort of deal. Everyone helps themselves, mutually benefits sort of thing. Uh, the US, if we make much, a bunch of stuff and we only sell it to US citizens, that's like 300 million or so people right now. Um, but that's, uh, that's a big number, I realize. But wouldn't it be better if I could also sell my stuff to India and China and Europe and make my possible customer base go from like 330 million to like three and a half billion people? Uh, so the US is definitely gonna benefit from this, but they also benefit um, from being able to trade with everybody else for the reasons we mentioned before. We talked about comparative advantage and all that. We can't make everything. We've only got so many resources and people. So it's best if you get rid of these tariffs so that we can trade whatever we make well uh, to these other countries. And then if we need stuff, we can buy the stuff they make well from us. And that's what we've been doing for like, uh, how long has it been now? 80 years or so, 75 years or so. Uh, and it's been a very uh, beneficial program uh, to trade with all of these other countries. Uh, over time. Didn't start out that way, like China was not in the GATT Treaty uh, initially, nor was India. But na now, we do have a lot of uh, trade agreements with these countries, uh, and it started right here. Um, so, you did that with the jigsaw. After World War II, in the 50s and 60s, once this Marshall Plan kicks in, everyone's able to rebuild and reinvest in their economy, uh, and this GATT Treaty has got a lot more world trade going than it was before, at cheaper, lower prices, uh, we have a period that's known as something where pretty much everybody who's in this network, the US, Western Europe, Japan, uh, South Korea, all these places that were just totally demolished, recover super quickly. Uh, and they start producing things and their uh, populations get a lot more wealthy. They buy a lot more things to make their lives better. They start getting like indoor plumbing, electricity, things like that. I don't know what that period of time is called. That's like uh, tw almost 20, 30 years-ish. Yeah, this is known as the post-war economic boom. And any country using market, um, this is kind of roughly, I would say, I don't know exactly what year we could start it. We could say 1950, I guess. But it's going to go all the way till about 1970 to 73-ish. That's when it's going to kind of peter out. Uh, so it's a huge, huge, huge uh, economic growth, a period of economic growth. Uh, and again, the stats don't lie on this one. Uh, the communist nations were not a part of it. Uh, other nations that kind of did like a mixed sort of, we want to hold on to our tariffs and make our stuff ourselves, like India, they don't do so well. Uh, but the countries that are part of this network of free trade uh, do very well, actually. So this GATT treaty, just to show you kind of how well it did, they started with 23 countries uh, that signed on. By uh, 1994, when they became the World Trade Organization, there was 123 countries in it. Uh, that's how uh, successful it was. So they got 100 countries to sign on because this agreement was working so well. All right, so what you could say is following World War II, the US definitely wanted to promote free trade and it definitely uh, benefited the United States, but it also benefited the other uh, countries because we got to help them provide, by providing them with uh, loans. And then we also got helped by uh, uh, reducing tariffs so we could um, continue to sell them stuff and then we can get stuff from them uh, that we need. So it was a very, what you call, mutually beneficial uh, policy. Any questions about that? Sweet, I'm gonna do something that I can keep forgetting to do. What did the US do after World War II? <clears throat> Economically. They and ask, ourselves. Yeah. Yep. Like they would um, ask other countries to be a part of this, like, this plan. Yep. Like the Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan, there we go. Nice. And what was the plan? Because uh, it, it, it's wonderful, but there are definitely strings attached. So, like, I don't want to say that it was all greed or it was all our altruism trying to help people. That was definitely a combination of both. 
Do you remember what the strings were attached? What were the strings? They had to, um, they would give like other countries like loans of like dollars to like improve like their countries. Yep. But what they had to do was be a part of like free market or free trade with no tariffs at all. Yep, they had to have a free market economy and, 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 and uh, uh, reduce the trade barriers between them. Exactly, cool. Um, all right, that's one way. So this is going to help a lot of countries rebuild, even countries we were just at war with years before, Japan, Germany, etc. All right, so that does help Western Europe and Japan and all that rebuild. Um, what about promoting trade across the world, reducing the price of it so you can trade for what you need and make what you make best? Did you hear it? Yep, exactly. It's really going to benefit the countries that sign up. It's bent around free trade, reducing tariffs so that you can buy stuff more cheaply and sell it more cheaply, and that, that actually helps everybody out in the long run. There are definitely some uh, negative sides to this, which we'll talk about, I think, in two weeks, but there are way more benefits than there are negatives to it, uh, and free trade is really going to help out um, everyone that's involved. Yeah, so it goes from 23 countries to 123 uh, pretty quickly. Um, what was the, I'll give you money for that, good answer. What was the name of the organization that uh, this becomes in 1947 that is unfortunately the target of the 9-11 attacks? The World Trade Organization. Yeah, World Trade Organization, right. Talk with them in uh, one week or two weeks, what they do exactly. All right, and lastly, this period of uh, economic growth that occurred like really, really quickly <clears throat> for the US, Western Europe, Japan, South Korea, et cetera, uh, for about 20-ish years. What was that called? Post-economic, uh, post-war. Uh, yeah, post-war economic, boom, well done. Cool, let's get this slide. How do you know, because we talk about economic growth and post-war boom, how do I actually know the economy grew? How on earth could I know that? Could I do it through, oh, what you got? When wages went up and all that. That's true, but how do I know what wages went up and how much? Maybe I got a raise, but how do I know you got a raise? Compare raises. <laughs> so I'll just go around and ask everybody, how much do you make and how much did you make last year? Like, <laughs> wouldn't quite work that way. Okay, so they can buy more things. Is that kind of what you were saying? I missed the first like few words you said because you were kind of quiet. Um, so like, okay, so you, are you saying track their spending? Is that kind of what you're saying? Okay, to an extent. Okay, so one person talks about wages. Uh, somebody, you just mentioned that you can look at their spending. I think you mentioned. I think you're talking to about living standards, and yes. There, there's no question that from 1950 to 1973, oh, and onward, by the way, it's not like it stopped at 73, but in this post-war economic boom, huge increase in living standards. And it, it's really hard to, and I mean, I haven't experienced it myself, obviously, because I was born in 87, but um, before the 50s, the, the odds that you had electricity in your house and running water, um, and access to uh, your basic necessities at a, at a cheap, low price, pretty low. In the US and Western Europe, they were higher than normal, but at this point, in the 50s uh, to the 70s, Western Europe, Japan, South Korea, uh, many parts of Southeast Asia uh, and East Asia, United States, Canada, et cetera, all of a sudden, we have these highway systems that are stretching everywhere, so it's easier to drive everywhere. Um, I have a toilet, a functioning toilet, and I know that's like, yeah, duh, of course you do, we got toilets everywhere. That wasn't common. Uh, running water you could drink or use to cook, like these are all things that we're just used to that people didn't have before. <clears throat> so that was absolutely increased. So yeah, you could look at living standards going up, definitely. But it's not a number. I can't look at a number. I could maybe look at a percentage of households that have running water, et cetera, which, which could be good. Um, but how do I know the economy got better? Because that could just be the government paid for, you know, infrastructure improvements. Okay, investments. I like that. 
Okay, you guys got all parts of what they use, all right, especially uh, these two. The wages are a little harder. Uh, that's how we look for inflation, but we'll talk about that more on the next slide, I think. So here's how they do it. It's really hard to do a microeconomic analysis. Now, microeconomics, in case you already forgot, that's when you're looking at individual businesses and the behavior of individuals. Like, I can't tell if the economy is getting better or not. I can see maybe demand is higher. Uh, but the way that they're going to measure this is uh, with macroeconomics. And this is a, a much more popular practice after uh, the Great Depression. So looking at the economy as a whole to see, oh my goodness, are we falling backwards again into a depression or are we going forward and growing? Like what's going on? So one thing you look at, which we'll talk more about, um, uh, well actually we did talk about the uh, depression. Unemployment rates are a good uh, marker. So if you've got a number that's higher, like uh, seven or 8% in the United States plus, then you're starting to look kind of shaky. You get over 10, it's definitely shaky in the United States. Europe's different, but uh, when you start getting close to or in the double digits for a percentage unemployed, that's usually a bad sign for the US. Like right now, we're around four-ish percent, five percent unemployment. Uh, that's a good marker, but here's the marker that they start using. It's a term you've probably heard before. Uh, it's called gross domestic product. And this is the marker that they, they look for. It's not perfect. But it's a good, it gives you a good idea of, is your economy growing or not? And what they really look at, they don't look at wages so much, but what they look at are these two. How much people spent and how much they uh, uh, invested um, in buying things. So it's basically all about how much you spent for the most part. This doesn't include stocks, and uh, it doesn't include like uh, uh, investments in the bank and things like that. That's all counted as savings. All right, this is how much people actually spent. Like, I bought something from you. All right, and we get this from people's tax info uh, when they report their, their gross earnings. All right, so gross domestic product. This is basically all the stuff, this is goods and services, made and consumed in a country in one year. So let's say, for example, I our country spends uh, $15 trillion this year. Million, billion, trillion. Uh, and the next year, we find out that the American people spent $16.5 uh, trillion. What does that tell me? The number went up, what does that mean? Okay, you're right. It, it is a good indicator that the economy is better. Why is that an indicator that the economy is doing better? They had more money to spend. Yeah, they got more money to spend, right? So they have more disposable income. This is, if, the, if it goes down, that's probably a bad sign. That probably means we've got unemployment. Uh, people don't have extra money to spend uh, because they're not earning enough because they're unemployed or, or, or whatever factors are, 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 are contributing to it. Uh, but usually, if that number goes up uh, every year, whether it's a little bit or a lot, that's a good sign, all right? If it's ever like really, really low, or it doesn't go up, or it goes down, that's usually a bad sign. In fact, if it does go down, uh, if it went down to 14.5 uh, for a couple quarters, that's when you start labeling either a recession, it's going backwards a little bit, uh, or if it's really severe, like it's down to 12, uh, then it might be considered a depression, all right? That's a good way of, 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 of knowing, basically how much we've uh, all spent. Uh, I wouldn't prefer to spend too much time looking at this, but it is definitely on the final uh, that we all agreed on for the district. So I'm going to actually show you um, at least the formula for it. I'm never going to make you calculate it, don't worry, because I mean, the numbers are in the billions and trillions, and that's just annoying. Uh, but this is how you actually uh, calculate it. So the, the uh, formula is this. It's sig xm. I know you're like, what is that? I'll tell you briefly. Uh, what they stand for, basically. The C is consumption. That's how much we all spend. So all the times that you and your parents spend money on Amazon, whether it's, uh, or Wayfair, you know that thing they just built over there on the, off the freeway? Uh, or at Costco, or wherever the hell you spend your money. That's almost all the money. So this is consumer spending, basically crap that we bought. That's 70% of the GDP. It's almost all of it. All right. I is for, oh, it's investment something. I forget what it actually stands for, but I know what it is. This is uh, basically what businesses are, are investing. 
And I don't mean like uh, stocks. I mean the uh, capital for your business. So if I buy a tractor or something like that for my business or I buy uh, whatever machinery or cars or fuel for my uh, business, I would log it as a business expense. That's considered an investment. All right, and again, I don't mean like I put money in the bank or I put it into a stock. That's not counted towards GDP. That's all savings. Uh, this is like I actually buy something for my business. It's capital. All right, so investment uh, in your business. This one, it's uh, uh, for government investment. And again, I don't mean money they save. Like here's your social security check. That's not counted. Here's your food stamps. That's not counted. This is the crap that the uh, government actually buys. So military equipment would be one. The contracts they give out where they pay for the uh, supplies and things for roads, like that all uh, would be uh, government expenditures. So government spending. Uh, and this is exports minus imports. So this basically means this is the crap. I'm not going to write crap right there. This is the stuff. There we go. Uh, we sell to other countries. Obviously, so if we make a bunch of stuff and ship it off to China and Europe and all those other places, that counts. Somebody's buying it, so we're making money. But we do take off the imports. I will give you a lot of Morgan Bucks if you can tell me why we take off the imports. So again, we're trying to figure out how much money. I know, that's why I'm giving you a lot of Morgan Bucks, because it's a confusing question. Uh, we're trying to figure out how much money we've all spent, basically. So this is how much we all spend in our lives. This is how much we spend on our businesses. This is how much the government spends on its stuff. Uh, and also the stuff we make for other countries. Why do I take away imports? You were first, and then you're second, and she doesn't get it. So why won't we count it? You're right. There are imports. We're consuming imports. Why do I take it off? We're spending money on these two. But we didn't have the free trade policy. Oh, it doesn't matter if we have free trade. It's all stuff that we buy from other countries, whether there's tariffs or not. Good guess, though. I like where you're going with that. You were second, but your hands down. You, do you still want to take a shot at it? It would be because you take away imports from our exports because it costs us money to buy from other countries. Or, or spending money here, too. It does have to do the fact that it involves other countries, though. So you're on track, right? This is all money spent, right? It's, uh, spending uh, to produce for, for other people that they bought, spending the government did, government businesses did, we did. Uh, kind of. You're getting closer. It's not that simple. That's why there's so many Morgan Bucks if you can get this. Now there's more hands coming up. You were next, then you were next, then you were next. So. Okay, so when you get import, usually it's like for other people to sell it so wait say that again if you can import like the imports they're bringing in it's like for people to take those imports and sell it to like different markets in the united states so we're not necessarily profiting off of it but spend, we're not spending money on either because it's going towards other people you guys are you guys are mercantilists like you you're, you've got this idea you guys are all mercantilists in this case you're like no no we don't want to spend money in other countries that's not quite it it's not saying this is bad like, if this number is bigger or smaller than that number, that's not relevant. Uh, but why do we have to take it off of this number? You guys are just, it's, it's tough, man. Is it because it says gross domestic product and domestic means the U, it's like you technically own it, like it's yours, right? So if it's imports, it's like it's not made in the United States, so it's not domestic. Oop, that's half. So I'm going to give you at least half of that. Cool. So that's half of it. Yeah, if it's gross domestic product, like what we made and consume, uh, we didn't make this. So we can't quite include that. So that's half of it. Cool, I'll give you half of that. I'll give you a triple for that one. All right, a triple though. No, actually I'll give you a, a, a quintuple. That'd be five, right? Yeah, <laughs> five. <laughs> I'll give you five if uh, you can uh, tell me why that's only half true. Wait, what did he even say? He said, <laughs> we, he says it's gross domestic product, the stuff that we made. He says, we didn't make it, so you're not going to count. And, and that's half true. It is half true. That's not the entire thing? Nope, it's not. What the hell? When I tell you, you're going to be like, oh my god, that was it. Is it because an import is something that we kind of need because we can't make it? So our money is going into something that we need. 
Yeah, that was like the mercantilist stuff you guys were saying. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna okay. Last last guess. No, it's part of the mercantilist thing. You guys are all saying the same thing in different ways. Sure? Guys, you're gonna you're not gonna be almost mad when I tell you this, how simple it is. I'm so right. you're half right. Yeah, what you're right. You? You're half right. We don't count it because somebody else made it. But <laughs> the reason why we don't count it is this is already included in this oh, because we all right. we always we're already counting the money we spent. So whether it's an import or not, we're, we're not gonna count it. Well, we didn't produce it, so that's half of it. But we're, we're already counting it because we're already counting what the government and businesses and private people are, are buying. So it's already here. We already oh. bought it, and they, they, they count it in the uh, product already. Six, ten, no, M. Is six? It's because they're spending money. Yeah. This is overall spending. Yeah, so that's it, that's it right there. So like, let's say, for example, uh, you, buy, um, you buy stuff at Walmart, right? What does almost all the stuff at Walmart say made in on it? China, 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 right? Or some other country. So it's already here, and you already bought it from a business as, as a private consumer, so they already count it. That's why they, they take it off. So number one, we didn't make it. And number two, it's already included the number because your purchases are from stores here, uh, and you already uh, in include the stuff that was made from the other countries that was shipped in. All right. So it's like really complicated, but then it's also kind of simple, but that's what it is. So you do, again, I'm not going to need you to know specifically what all these stand for or how to calculate it, but you will definitely have to know the formula, um, and that's what, what, it, what it stands for. So the, the odds that you'll remember it now are slightly higher than if I just said, remember this, sig xm, uh, but that's, uh, that's what it essentially is. Okay, but one more thing I wanna ask you about this number before we, we, we get the slide and, and take our break is this. Why can't I, no, how can I phrase this? Okay, so we made roughly 16 something trillion dollars in GDP as, as, the, as a country in the United States last year. It was, it was close to that, it was 16 something. We'll just say 16.5. That's a big number. It's a lot of zeros. Look at us, look how much money we spent that, that, that we have. Okay, so that's in 2019. Um, but in, uh, I'm gonna make the number up. No, I'm just gonna look the number up. No, I can't use my phone right now. Well, I'm gonna make the number up then. Let's say in 1950, our GDP was, what would it have been roughly? Maybe it would have been something like $3 trillion. It was probably more than that, but I'm just kind of guessing. So you look at that number, right? And you say, oh my gosh, clearly, our economy has grown. Because the number is bigger, right? Why isn't that necessarily true, though? Because we used a different value at that time. Yes, okay, cool. A 1950s dollar is different than a 2019 dollar. All right, so the issue is uh, value. All right, now if I'm comparing numbers in the same year, that would work because it probably has about the same value. 1950, though, totally different value. Some of you are like, what does that even mean? Well, here's what I mean. Our money has less value now than it did in 1950. Here's an example. In 1950, it cost, oh, what was it? It wasn't quite 10 cents. It was like 20 or 30 cents. I have the number up here specifically. It was around, let's just say it was 25 cents. It was 25 cents per gallon uh, for gas. Now, it's, it's more here, but the country's average is more like $2.70 or so. All right, so um, while this number is definitely lower, it doesn't mean necessarily, it could, it doesn't necessarily mean that our economy grew. It does actually in our case, but right now, for example, gas is about on average, I think 264, that might be the exact number, a gallon. It's like, okay, yeah, but in 1950, it was around 28 cents a gallon or something like that. So gas, the, the dollar is almost one-tenth of the value that it was uh, in 1950. So if, if, and I made this number up, if this was true, and it cost me 10 times the amount per gallon of gas that it did, roughly, then uh, we actually lost money, as far as value goes, if this was the actual number. I don't know if it's the actual number of 1950. But if uh, a gallon's 10 times more expensive, and I'm not making 10 times more money, then we actually technically lost money, uh, as far as value goes, all right? So that's why I can't just look at the number by itself and be like, oh, it's a bigger number, therefore it grew. Not necessarily the case, because the dollar is actually worth less now than it was in 1950, 1960, 1970, and, and so on and so forth backwards. So 
I have to, if I want an accurate number, I have to look at what's called real data. And I don't mean like not fake. Real data means uh, adjusted for inflation. And that's exactly how they do it, by the way. They look at the value of things that everyone's buying, like gas, like uh, 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 certain, what are the other commodities? They basically like look at a bunch of things that everyone's buying, like you know milk and eggs and uh, gasoline and things like that that everyone has to buy, and they compare how much did it cost here and how much did it cost here, and that's how they're able to look and see um, what the inflation actually is. So if you ever look at a chart and it doesn't say it's adjusted for inflation or that it's uh, real GDP or real data or that it is in 2019 dollars, where they kind of translate it to what in 1950 would have been in today's money, uh, don't believe it. Uh, real data means it's adjusted for inflation. So I'm actually accurately looking at how much money was actually made compared to what I could buy with it. If it's not, if it's not adjusted for inflation, then you call it nominal. It's just the number. So this money could be, if in 10 years it was like, what's uh, 170 trillion. And you could say, wow, that's a lot of growth in 20, how many years did I say, 50? Whatever, we'll just say 50. In 2069, oh my gosh, we make so much more money. Look how much economic growth there was. But then I find out that the price of gas, for example, is like uh, $97 a gallon. Uh, that would be a good example of being fooled by nominal data. Just looking at the number and be like, the number's bigger, therefore it's better. No, you want the real data when they adjust it for inflation. So they will take the amount of money they make, they'll divide them out by the people, see how much you get per capita, how much each person makes on average, and they'll also see what the stuff costs that you're buying, uh, and they'll weigh it and, and look at what the actual value is. You should know that the US has grown, the economy, since the 1950s, uh, but it's, it's not as much as it looks like. Because you, I mean, like my grandpa used to tell me he bought his house in 1950, no, 1964 or five, for like $30,000. It's like, that was a full house too. I don't mean like the show by the way. Like it was full houses in like, you know, and like three bedrooms, two bathrooms, kitchen, all that stuff, the yard and all that. Uh, you can buy a car for that. There's, there's a bunch of cars that are more expensive than that. That's on the cheaper end for cars now. Now houses in California or in the Bay Area where he lives, that same house is worth like six or $700,000. Um, so it looks like he made a bunch of money, but maybe he didn't. I don't know um, what the real uh, comparison in data is. All right, so that's that's what real and nominal are. How is that not an economic benefit? What do you mean? Because you're saying like how like money at one point like a while ago was like worth less than it is now. Yes. So how is that not economic benefit? Oh, it actually is, but you have to look at the real data because <laughs> there could be a chance this is not the case, but there could be a chance that thirty thousand dollars in nineteen fifty was worth more in nineteen fifty than seven hundred thousand dollars is now. What makes it worth? You can buy more with it. So like if uh, back then a house was $30,000, it's a good question by the way. Let's say a house was $30,000 in 1964, whenever you bought it, and now it's uh, 2019, and you could sell it for 700,000, let's say, in the Bay Area. Um, you look at that, you're like, look, he made $670,000. Of course he made money. But if like I said, the price of gas in 1964 was 50 cents, right? Uh, and then uh, for, for gas. And now, let's say, I'm going to make up a number, obviously. Let's say now it's like $7 a gallon. That's not actually more necessarily. It might be the same uh, or it might be less depending on the actual price of it. All right, so you have to look at what you can buy with that money 1950 compared to what you can buy now. Uh, in this case, though, Real estate in the Bay Area is, is, is really high value. So yes, this is definitely, uh, if you looked at, if you compared the 1950s money to, to the, or 1960 money to now, it would definitely be an increase. Uh, but you have to consider that. Because otherwise you could be fooled. Because like I said, you could go down and we make way more money in, uh, you know, in 50 years, but if everything's way more expensive, it's just gonna kind of cancel out. I gave an example early in the year where I said, uh, what are the odds you guys go to in and out if all you had was $10 to live off of for the month today? And it'd be pretty low if you were smart. Uh, but I said, what would the odds be if it was, if I gave you all $1,000? You're all way more likely to go in and out, right? If you have money, right? So the more money people have, the more they spend, then prices go up. So that's why you always have to adjust for that. Uh, you can't just look at the number by itself. 
So yeah, if you're looking at data, make sure it's real data adjusted for inflation. All right, I didn't think I was taking that long to do that slide, but it did.